This is your Places Call. You're listening to Theatrical Thoughts. I'm Emily Wyra. And I'm Jessica Fight. And today we are joined by Jeremy Morse. Jeremy is best known for playing Ogie in the Broadway production of Waitress, as well as the national tour, as well as his time as Wesselton in the national tour of Frozen. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. So we are so stoked. I know we've been talking about having you on for a while. We're so excited to finally get to chat. <laughs> Just like the DMs, the back and forth, the scheduling, and now we're Always. here. Always. You're That's talking. what I do best on this podcast is booking people. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking. We finally got the Zoom out, had your whole name on it. So fancy, very official. <laughs> I truly felt so special when I said it's like filming for Jeremy Morris. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> that's me that's my name <laughs> all right so we opened the show we were talking about this just a second ago we like to open it with our 60 second life story segment i'm gonna start my iphone stopwatch which is just so official very um, official here at theatrical thoughts <laughs> very very official and you know just 60 seconds for your entire life don't leave out the awesome parts no pressure at all. okay no pressure all right cool <laughs> you ready for this yeah i think all right here we go all right, so I was born in Pennsylvania. My parents are named Sharon and Jerry, and they're awesome. They raised me to be a cool slash um, nerdy kid who I had a rat tail until the age of like 15, which was not the coolest, but I feel like really defined me. That pushed me kind of into theater, like around 15, 16, I got into theater in high school, and I was like, oh my God, I love this so much. I also left that apart where I was two and my mom knew I was going to be a musical theater one day because I was singing um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs Hi Ho over and over again. She's like, oh, amazing. So um, I'm in high school. I'm like, oh my God, I should be do doing this for my real life. And I was like, I didn't know I could do that. So I auditioned for NYU. I got in, went through my four years, graduated, did some shows, Metro Iconis, did Blood Song of Love at um, the Ars Nova Theater in New York, got nominated for a drama desk, met my wife, then I got into Waitress Out of Town, Waitress Broadway, Waitress Tour, Frozen, we're married, and now we're gonna have a baby. That was oh amazing! My <laughs> you got through so much in that 60 that seconds! That was so impressive. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Take a breath. Just like a sprint. I feel like I might throw up after that. <laughs> Well, now no, we I, I was surprised. I was surprised down. I got a bunch in there. Um, I'm impressed, not gonna lie. That was pretty substantial. I feel like when I jumped back to talking about singing Hi Ho in um, when I was a little kid, that set me back. I feel like <laughs> that transition, yeah, if I just funny. included that, if I included it, if, if, I feel like it was very important. Um, but I feel like if I did that earlier on, I would have had like another five seconds to talk about something else. I don't know. <laughs> Instead of just like rattling off my resume and my my huge life. But I guess that's like part of, you know, that's the challenge. That's the revealing nature yeah. of that game. Precisely. Well, first of all, congrats about having a baby. That's so exciting. That's so exciting. Thank you. We're so pumped. Yay. That so, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, so now you and your wife, when did you guys meet? Okay, great. So we can like slow down. I don't have to like... <laughs> Rattle this you up. don't have to run now. We can just take a nice leisurely stroll through your life. Nice stroll through the park. <laughs> Perfect. So um, we met um, at a New Year's Eve party at my old apartment um, here in Washington Heights. Um, my roommate at the time, Bill Coyne, he invited my Alex over and he knew her through circles. Um, um, like we had like so many friend circles that like inter overlapped and uh, Alex and I. And Bill was one of those people where it overlapped, overlapped on. And she came over. I saw her. I was like, I'm okay. I'm obsessed with you. You're so pretty. And we drank champagne. And I sat next to her on our futon. Yes, futon. And we talked until three in the morning. I was like, um, I'm crazy about you. And I got her phone number. She was reluctant because she was actually, she was dating another guy at the time. And I got her phone. I was like, I just want to make sure you get home safe. She was like, okay. And I called her the next day and I told her I wanted to go see a movie with her. And she was like, we could go as friends. I was like, I am not interested in that at all. Um, yes, I want to be your friend, but like, no, like we are meant to be together. And so I was very persistent and we like hung out a couple times and like 
got food and just laughed with each other and were so happy together. And then she broke up with her boyfriend and it was like off to the races from that point. It was just fantastic. That is so touching. <laughs> Uh, I mean, persistence, you gotta get through. <laughs> yes, I was definitely, I was so persistent and I feel like very, very great about that. And it's cause I knew, like, I knew that like in that moment, I was like, I know what I want. Like you, we are a good fit for each other. I know this and it worked out. And that was six, a little over six years ago. That's amazing. Yeah, well, well six and a half almost. Again, that's incredible i'm so happy for you guys thanks yeah so, we're so we're so pumped crazy year crazy year so kind of backtracking i mean other things you had gut instincts about musical theater <laughs> so yeah do it in high school you said was that like your first kind of endeavor with it no i skipped a chunk in the 60 second sprint <laughs> uh i so i my parents were always like um i always loved to sing so they really fostered that with me and I was always in choir and I would be in um, like local community theaters. I started with this program called Upper Darby Summer Stage, which is in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. And if anyone is watching Mayor of Easttown, um, that's very close to Bryn Mawr, which is mentioned in Mayor of Easttown. Um, if you're watching that on HBO Max, very good show, highly recommend. But I digress. Um, I was doing just children's theater, like pay to play, I was my first show. I played a tree in Once on This Island Junior. I felt very great about that. And after that, it was every summer I do two shows. Then I started getting into like our, did the dance troupe there and the cabaret and the one acts. And then I started doing the main stage. But yeah, it wasn't until high school where I, um, my first, my freshman and sophomore years, I didn't do theater. I thought I was going to go into math or engineering or something like that, because I really did like that stuff. And I still kind of do. I, I'm currently getting my MBA and I don't know, I like, I love, I really enjoy the accounting courses, <laughs> which is very ogy of me as well, um, which I guess is apt. But I, yeah, that that's Upper Darby Summer Stage. That's like one of the real roots of my love for theater. They really sewed that in it was it was very cool i learned a ton working with awesome awesome people who love you know teaching kids and fostering the love of, of art so it was very cool that's awesome so now moving forward you ended up at nyu tell us about that experience and what really stood out for you at that time Sweet. So I got into NYU. This was also like, my parents were like, go for it. You should do this. And I was like, I'm terrified. I am also hiding myself view because that's something that's distracting by self. Um, so I, my parents were like, go for this. I was like, I'm scared. And then they were like, no, really go for it. And so we looked up programs together. NYU, I loved singing. So NYU, had a program in vocal performance, musical theater, which felt great. I felt like it really lined up with where my strengths were at the time. And that was Steinhardt. I got in and I, I mean, I had my doubts within the program. Uh, my freshman year, I was like, I don't know, is, is this right for me? Is this what I want to do? And then I ended up getting cast as Frankie Epps in Parade my freshman year. And it was just like an insane experience, like so cool, got to meet Jason Robert Brown, Alfred Urey and Hal Prince. It was just like nuts, The what was at our disposal, um, not disposal, at our, at our fingertips in New York. And we had an amazing director who I'm still friends with to this day, John Simpkins, who directed that production and went on to direct me in a ton of other productions at NYU and then professionally. So that's my freshman year, sophomore, junior, senior year. I feel like created a, an amazing community. I learned a, a great set of skills specifically from NYU with song analysis, which um, has to this day fueled my love of coaching and fueled my love of working with aspiring performers as well as professionals working on material. So I, I fell in love with, with that. And I made the most out of the, uh, the limited number of dance credits we we took in a vocal performance program 
in that I took a, a bunch of different tap classes, which is my favorite um, form of dance and uh, very much did not take much ballet and missed many classes because it was also at 8 a.m. That was my choice. And it's why I pass failed the class too. So um, I did pass, I did pass. Uh, I graduated in 2008 and then went into the, the real world. But that's my, that's my experience. I came out of school with, I feel like a great foundation in, in performance within musical theater. That's amazing. I think it's also so interesting, like the intricacies of vocal performance versus BFAMT. That must have been like, did you get a lot of musical theater kind of classes with that? Or was it more focused on like the vocal side of things? It was it was both. I mean, we had to take voice our every single semester, our entire um, time at NYU. We also had a ton of um, ton of song analysis and music theater rep. So it was constantly like one we had. I can't remember how many rep classes we had, but it was it was a bunch. And we would analyze different periods of musical theater history um, and just like explore like all those composers and um, have to do sets. And, I mean, this all culminated with our our senior recital where we kind of like had to pull from all these classes that we took and all this rep that we built. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else. We took musical theater history. Uh, there's also a, a big classical component. So we had to take mu uh, music history, which um, was, we had to take, I think, two sections of that. I can't remember. It felt like four. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't very passionate about that section, but um, I did, I did get through it. That must I guess. Cool, but sorry. The, no, you go. <laughs> um, it, it was just. Uh, I guess. I feel like the program at the time, and the program has shifted up now. I feel like it is more geared towards commercial uh, musical theater, in that they require more acting classes and more, like straight acting, scene scene analysis, analysis, monologue work. Uh, where when I was there, it was um, very much on the the outskirts of the program, and the same with dance where, um, yeah, I, coming out of that, I wish I had more of that. I wish there was also some film aspect, which is so important nowadays, especially with this medium that is in our lives for like the future. So yeah, sorry, I yield the floor. <laughs> no, 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 that must have been- much rather hear you talk than that. Oh moment, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that must have been such a cool experience. I want to use my dream school. So a little jealous. Oh, cool. I'd love to go. <laughs> but that's such a cool experience that must have been. And I'm sure that, it, I mean, despite the lack of dance credits, must have been really valuable. <laughs> yes, I. it was so valuable. I, I wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah. So I want to know, so you graduate NYU, and then you mentioned you had, is that, are you heading right into Blood Song of Love? Or like, what was the kind of time frame there? No, Blood Song of Love was kind of like, um, that was in 2010, but I did some readings in 2009. So I graduated, I had like, I felt so, I was like booked and blessed. I had three gigs lined up right out of school. I was in the ensemble of My Fair Lady at the Agumquit Playhouse, non-equity. Then I was um, the assistant director to John Simpkins, who I mentioned for Joe Iconis of his production of Black, Black Suits at uh, The Public, which was that summer, which was so such a cool experience. And then I went on another Joe Iconis show, uh, the national tour of The Plant That Ate Dirty Socks, which was a TheaterWorks USA show, which is theater for young audiences. So uh, that's, that's where I got my equity card. They are remarkably difficult productions to do because you're not only an actor, you're also signed on as an assistant stage manager. So you're building the sets, driving the vans, packing the vans, unpacking the vans, setting up sound, doing your own laundry, like of your costumes, setting up props, sound system, all that. So, and you're playing one-nighters. And when I say one-nighters, I mean, you get up at six, you set up the set at 7 a.m., you perform at eight, and then you, you finish your show, you reset, and you probably have another show at like 11, and then you drive to the next town. So it was grueling, but uh, awesomely rewarding. And one of my good buddies, F. Michael Haney, 
he was on that show. We got our equity cards together and we, the next show we get to do together is the frozen tour. So he's Olaf from the frozen tour. So it's like this long arc of, from a very difficult tour to like a very wonderful tour. <laughs> Not no shade on TheorWorks USA. They're, they do awesome stuff and it's so rewarding to perform, perform for kids, but it's a tough job. That's so cool. We love a full circle moment. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that tour sounds like it must have been dude how much sleep did you get <laughs> like also we're the per diem is so limited like we don't get a ton of money to like book hotels so we were all pinching pennies like crazy so we would sleep there were four guys in the show we'd sleep four to a room with the two like the two double beds <laughs> Which was just like, and like I'm I'm a smaller human, but some of the other guys were like bigger dudes, and it was uh, it was trying. Every once in a while, I would be like, all right, I'm splurging. I just need I need my own bed tonight, so I'm just like we can share a room, but I just need my own bed. It was uh, it was a lot. So yeah, that that ended in December of 2008. Then I hit, I got my equity card. 2009 was like a struggle year for me. And that I didn't know where I fit in the musical theater world. I wasn't prepping my auditions well enough. I wasn't, I didn't know what I was like going to do. I was trying, I thought I was going to be like uh, somebody who was in the chorus and just like doing that. And I didn't quite have the dance chops to support that. And so I was framing myself in a problematic way. And that led me to unemployment, which led me to getting my real estate license. And I got my real estate license in New York in 2009. And I ended up doing that for a little under four years. Uh, and it was while I was doing that, that I started, Joe started asking me to do readings of the show Blood Song of Love. First title was the Untitled Spaghetti Western Musical. Uh, the Untitled Rock and Roll Spaghetti Western Musical. That's what it was. And so I developed that for about a year with Joe. And then we opened off off Broadway at Ars Nova in 2010. And Fred, from that point on, it was kind of like off to the races work-wise. And I were, I've worked, I've been very lucky. I've worked pretty consistently from that point on up until, you know, the pandemic. Okay, the real question is, why would they change the title? That's so much better. I was going to say, that's such a, that's such a um, show title, too. I mean. Right? That is. It was. Um, I mean, the show, like, I still, for, for, my, for my heart, I keep, we have all these different versions of the script, and I have all of them, like, the first one, the next, the, like, and then the first one, and then our final, like, edited script that we ended, landed on for the off the the production of Ars Nova. It was so cool. It's like the best show I've ever done. I don't know if it could be done anymore. I played like, with a, we'd have to do it with tweaks, but it was just, you know, it, it was all, it was like, I was a white man playing like a, like a Mexican villain. That's not something that should be done, but we did it at the time. And, and that was, that. I mean, I, I don't have to be Mexican if we did it again, but it's, you know, problematic stuff but such a beautiful show, so funny, S so funny. Like the comedy in that show is fantastic. And I miss it. And that's why I have this mug. That's awesome. So now moving ahead, you booked this little show called Waitress. Uh, not sure if what? many people have, hear have heard about it. Jesse, I've never heard of that show. I It's not like it got so much buzz and like, you know. It makes sense, yeah. Nominations or anything. <laughs> yeah. So one of our favorite things is we love hearing about like the audition process and how you booked it. So tell us about that. Totally. So the audition process, I remember getting the audition and I had no idea. I didn't know what Waitress was when I saw, like, when my manager sent me the audition and the breakdown. And it said for Ogie in this musical Waitress. And then I saw the names of Sarah Bareilles and Diane Paul. So I was like, oh, oh, this is like a legit, this is like a legit audition. So I prepped my brains out for that audition. And I remember just like, dr I was building Ikea furniture and drilling the lyrics, never getting rid of me. Cause I was like, there are so many lyrics and I want to go in and like, know them for this audition and so um the audition fell on a day where i was catering in central park with my girlfriend at the time now wife and i had to get somebody to cover me to go to 
this audition. So I got my friend Michael Linden to come and sub in for me because I, I was catering, but I was my job because it was such a huge event. It was the Chase 5K Challenge. Uh, and it was like hundreds of caterers. So I was in charge of watching everyone's coats and bags, which was like a chill job. I just got to like sit on my laptop and like connect to the park Wi-Fi and like do that. And so I, you know, I, I got my friend Michael to like literally watch everything for three hours while I took a cab down to Telsey and audition. And the audition experience was, was wild because I walked into the room. I had no idea it was going to be everybody. Like, all the producers, full creative team, full everybody. This was also like three weeks before ART was starting. Um, so I was like, this is insane. And I walk in and I, the only material that I had to do was the, the scene right before Never Getting Rid of Me and Never Getting Rid of Me. And that was it. So I walked in, did that. And I remember I, I forgot the lyrics multiple times within there, but I would I would just like stop and be like, I forgot the lyrics and uh, let's take it back from the last verse, a five, six, seven, eight. I'd do like a box step or like a, a pivot step and they laughed and I finished and everybody like laughed and like, you know, like a light polite clap and um, and everyone was like quiet and Diane Pauls was like, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I was like, all right, great back to Central Park. So I walked out of the room and I thought I was like, all right, that felt good. But like, you know, a thank you like that usually means like, all right, thank you, but no, thank you. And Bernie tells you ran outside the room. And he's like, hey, Jeremy, can you stick around for like, um, we're running a little behind. Like, can you stick around for like 30, 40 minutes and then we'll get back to you and we'll run some stuff and work on the material and sing something from your book. I was like, I actually, I need to be back in Central Park. And he's like, what are you doing? Proposing? I was like, no, I'm, I'm working a catering gig. And he was like, okay, I, I hear you. We'll get you back in five minutes. So I went in after the next person and they gave me some like adjustments uh, on the material Diane did. And then Sarah had me sing something from my book. I sang, I chose right from baby. And I, I finished and everyone was like beaming and Fran Weisler stood up, stood up and gave me a hug. She goes, you were fantastic. And I was like, that's vet. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And so I, I, I left that. I was like, all right, well, if I don't get it, I don't get it. But I felt awesome about that entire experience. And uh, the next day I had another audition for another thing in Central Park. So I was like, all right, we're going to go through this again and do another audition. And I, got a call from my manager that morning be like, you're the guy. Um, we just have to like figure out a couple of logistics and you're, you're the guy. I was like, this is insane. I, at the time I was also working for Theater Works USA. So I was supposed to start, this was Friday. I was supposed to start rehearsal for the production of Skippy John Jones 2, Snow What? at the Lucille Lortel Theater, um, in which I would have played a chihuahua as well as uh, the mama chihuahua, uh, mama cat, and a the evil bruja, an evil witch. It's a very funny show. Kevin DeLagula directed it and wrote it, and, it, and Eli Bolin all wrote the music. So funny, so incredible. But I had to pull out from that, and they were like, congratulations, but also this sucks. We have no time to find somebody. But they did. They found somebody eventually. Um, but yeah, that's my audition story. I, I didn't have any callbacks. It was literally just like in the room, out for five minutes, back, done. And that's it. And that's the only audition I've had for Waitress. That's insane. Yeah, it was what I mean, I know people who are like, I've been in for Waitress 13 times and finally I got it. And it's just I was so for it lined up in that moment where Chris Fitzgerald couldn't do the out of town because he was doing Act of God on Broadway. Act of God, Hand of God, Act of God. I don't know. We can, you know, <laughs> people can go check that. I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, yeah, and that was that was that. And then I did the out of town as Ogie, and it was an insane, stressful, wonderful experience developing a commercial show with a huge team. That's so incredible. So now out of town, like, were you guys changing the show super, super frequently or like kind of? 
like so much. Like it was so changing so much. And I, I love working on new, new pieces. So it's not something that was foreign to me. Uh, it was just stressful. I feel like there was, you know, I, I had never been attached to a commercial production that like we knew was bound for Broadway. Like we all knew that it was going to Broadway. And I had never been in that position before. I never had so much, I had never had, had gained so much and had so much to lose, or seemingly from my perspective at the time, felt like I had so much to lose. Yeah, for sure. So now you did know that it was going to Broadway the kind of the whole time. So with that knowledge, like, did you know that you were staying with the show and like? No, I had no idea. And I knew that I, I knew that Chris Fitzgerald was a part of it. I didn't know if he was moving forward. I thought maybe he was. So I was like, am I going to be Ogie? My, my mindset at the end, of, like once the show ended, was like, I'm either Ogie or I don't get it. And then I got the call. Um, I was doing a production of Into the Woods at North Carolina Theater in Raleigh, North Carolina. And my manager was like, so you're not being offered Ogie, but you're getting your first, broad you're getting your Broadway debut. And I was like, what's happening? How do I feel about this? And I was like, I'm mad I'm an Ogie, but also like it's Chris Fitzgerald and he's been doing all the readings. Okay. And it's my Broadway debut. It was like the weirdest, like mixed emotions feeling. And then in like the negotiations, they're like, and we want you to be like, you're our like replacement. Like when Chris leaves, like you're our guy. Um, and so that, that helped me mentally in that moment. Um, but like looking back, I was so, so lucky and fortunate to be in that place. I mean, Fitzgerald's a legend and it was, it was so cool to watch him work and do his thing in the Broadway process. And uh, yeah, wild, wild emotional ride. I feel like nothing is ever, is ever the way that you expect it to be. Nothing, it, life doesn't give you what you expect. Usually. Absolutely. So I'm really curious, like on the night of your opening, like Broadway debut, like I love hearing these kinds of stories. Like what, what was that Broadway debut night for you? Like what emotions were you experiencing? Um, the Broadway debut night was like, the, the opening night was, was nuts. And just like the electricity in the audience was crazy. Uh, I, the, the most impactful night for me was actually the night of our first invited dress, which was right before our first preview, where we performed for an audience. I was like, this is the, this is my first performance on a Broadway stage. And for me, that was like the one I was like, I can't believe people are seeing this. We have no idea how the show is going to be received because there have been so many shifts and so many changes from the ART production and trying to find the tone of Waitress in a commercial Broadway house because ART was like a 400 seat theater going to the Brooks, which is two and a half times that two and a half to three times that it's just it's a different it's a different beast so no one had any idea what to expect um and it was really met with i feel like a ton of praise and then we did so much work in the preview process to shift it and change it and i i like the show that was landed on is, is so beautiful and i it always retained the heart that the movie possessed and the heart that was infused into the ART version, which was so, which was darker and heavier and more of a chamber piece compared to what it landed on, which was a more bubbly, effervescent version of the story, which still maintained the depth specifically through Jenna's character. Yeah, definitely. So then you eventually went on to be part of the first national tour of, wait of Waitress as Ogie. What was that experience like? Um, that experience was was wild. Um, it, it was also such a crazy thing having to like leave New York. It was like signing on for a year long contract. I was like, I just, I got engaged to, to Alex right before we, we left um, on the tour and it was it was very cool to be a part of the show in another iteration and the creative team took a lot of time to rework moments and kind of shift the show for this new cast and help mold like mold the show around individual talents which was 
Cool. Uh, I, so awesome. I think that's the best way that a creative team can work in taking the specific talents of the people who are in this, whatever version, whatever iteration of the show and, you know, molding, molding the piece around them, not changing the core of it, but molding the piece to, to personality and specific talents. I, um, yeah. And I feel like, I feel like they did that in such a beautiful way with the tour, the tour, when we started, um, I mean, even when finishing, it, it was such a tight, awesome version of the show. It shaved minutes off the Broadway production, the leaner, meaner. Um, and it was a great group too. I, I loved it. Touring was awesome and tough. And I, I, I hated being away from Alex and being away from the city. I still hate it when I have to leave, but um, we were so fortunate and maybe this is jumping ahead. But um, after we launched the, the tour and it was, it was so, so exciting and crazy. And we were met with like awesome reviews. Not that that necessarily matters, but it, it felt great as a great pick me up and a validation for the, for the whole company. And we were selling out like crazy uh, a year in, right, right before we were going to LA, we were here in New York city. And I found out that one of the ensemble members was gonna leave the show at the year mark or like right before the year mark and i was like oh my gosh i want i want alex to be in the show she'd be perfect um so like we reached out to like to casting we're like hey we'd love to submit alex she'd love to be considered for this ensemble track and so casting was like yes make a video right now and we we're like in the middle of midtown we we're like how can we rent a studio we don't have anybody to play piano sweet we're just gonna do it acapella um, and so like we made an acapella video for Alex in, I forget the name of the studios, but it's, it's in Chelsea. And we, we recorded a couple of songs and went and sat down at a bar and drank some beers and edited it on iMovie on our phones and sent it in and we're like, fingers crossed. And she then, she had a callback that she had to do a couple days later. And then we found out like later that week, it was like, great, you're, you're in. And we'd like you to start rehearsing in like two weeks. And we're like, what and we got to do the show for an entire year together and that was a big motivator for for me staying out on the road even longer also it's like oh he's such an awesome part like i i got to a point where i was just like addicted to the comedy and also what's so cool about the role and the fact that like when we went to so many different cities i can't remember how many the tally at the end but it, it was like 50 some cities 60 maybe more I mean, we did 24 cities in the last 26 weeks, in the first 26 weeks of 2019. It was like nuts. We did so many cities. It's got to be more than 50. I don't know. That's I'm not good at counting. <laughs> but what was so cool is like going to all these different theaters that have like all different houses and different spaces and how, how that affected the audience, also the demographics of every single city of, you know, impacts the way an audience responds. And that was such a cool thing to navigate. Sometimes awesome, sometimes frustrating. Like when we were in Naples, no shame in Naples, beautiful city. I think the average age was somewhere in like the triple digits. So there was something that was problematic in that, in that there was not enough strength to laugh or clap. So <laughs> it was a very quiet, quiet night of, of waitress with very little laughter, but they loved it. They enjoyed it so much. And it was like very clear um, when they, when they did applaud and at the end, when they saved it all up for those, that applause at the end of the show. And I just want to say, I love Naples. I think it's beautiful. Quiet crowd, quiet crowds. That's too good. <laughs> so I'm really curious, like, especially in a role that plays into the comedy so much like how do you sort of cater the performance when the demographics are so different and the audience is responding so differently like how does that kind of fuel you on your side of the stage and this is something that i think i i i've struggled with in the beginning and wrestled with that if an audience wasn't like giving me what i want i would push i'd be like Come on, like let's laugh and i'd go bigger and that got me into trouble storytelling wise with the character and the creative team would come out and you know they'd be like oh this moment's getting too big let's pull it back you can play with this moment more blah 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 um and so i i realized through the repetition and the experience like okay you can't you can't change the show for for the crowd you can't shift 
who Ogi is and how big he is to cater to a specific audience if they're giving in, like if they're giving you a ton of energy or, or not. I mean, inherently there will be moments where if an audience is going crazy, it, like that energy will affect you. And that's part of the, the awesomeness of live theater and that the audience has a say in, in how the show goes and how the flow of the show goes. If they clap, if they laugh, that, that interrupts, that changes the beast. So that's something that I loved. And uh, yeah, but it, it was it was tough because I, I would always want to get a bigger laugh. But I realized that also like sometimes a big laugh early on in the scene can come to the expense of laughs later. All about the arc of the comedy and, and the science of the comedy. Definitely. And Emily, I always say we're so excited to get that energy back when live theater returns. We're going to just be, <laughs> oh my God, we're going to be on I know. the floor crying when that happens. Oh, yes. <laughs> Everyone will be on the floor crying. No oh, one will absolutely. be in their seats. Yeah. That is 1000% correct. <laughs> <laughs> so now moving on, you went on to tour as the Duke of Wesselton or the Duke of Weaseltown in Frozen. No, no. <laughs> Wesselton. Um, yes, yes. Went on tour. Um, as the Duke of Wesselton. And uh, yeah, what was so crazy about that experience is Alex and I, we set our wedding September 21st, 2019. And I auditioned while I was for that, while I was on the road with Waitress. I remember we made an audition tape, we were in Atlanta and we did it in my dressing room. And it was like the jankiest audition tape where, it, what needed to be recorded it was it was two scenes it was the first Wesselton scene and then the blanket scene which comes right before Hans of the Southern Isles reprise and so I took hand towels and I wrapped myself in as many hand towels as possible I'm like I'm an idiot and sent that in heard nothing for two weeks and then they were like hey would you fly in for uh for final callbacks I was like okay so I I did. I, we were in Florida at the time. I flew. Um, I flew in. I had one day Monday. I had a day of auditions, three sessions, and then Tuesday morning final in front of everybody. And then I got the call like later that week that I got it. And we had set our wedding day for September twenty first. The start date for rehearsal was September twenty third. <laughs> so it was like. Oh my gosh. Uh, initially we were told that it could be as early as like September, like, like a week or two earlier. And I was like, I'm, I, our wedding is happening. Like, there's no way we're shifting this. Our wedding is happening on this day. And they were like, okay, don't worry about it. It's the 23rd. I was like, okay, good, good, good. Um, so yeah. And that was, that was a crazy experience. It was that rehearsal experience was also very luxurious and in, in, in the sense that the creative team, much like the creative team of Waitress did with the tour, um, the Frozen creative team took a lot of time to develop the show with these people and recraft these scenes and staging and um, had some of their own ideas that they wanted to, to put into the show because most shows, most Broadway commercial productions run out of time and run out of money. But the creative team wants to keep changing things. And at a certain point, the show has to be frozen and performances have to start. Right, and I mean, except for Spider-Man, um, which was a unique beast and had what, like a year of previews. And then, yeah, anyway, we don't have to talk about Spider-Man, but it was a very cool, uh, a cool process with um, watching that. And the thing is like the Duke, the Duke's not a huge part of the show. He's, he's like a, he's like a fake out villain where he's he's just there to be like it's him this guy's the bad guy not hans hans is amazing um and then hans just pulls out the rug in the neck too oh what a devil oh my god too good so i gotta know i guess this was this like your first time working for disney like the disney yeah too? so i guess how was that experience and kind of being part of that disney machine and all that magic i guess <laughs> The Disney machine is is remarkable. And I I've never felt so supported by a company. And they it's because they have they really just have the resources to back it up. And so you know, so much theater 
e even like commercially produced Broadway theater, they're scraping together investors to fund a show that is probably going to be over budget. And it's, it's tough. There's, there's very few companies that can sustain a high level of basically a, like of care and exceed that in a theatrical realm. I mean, what is it? It's like Wicked has the, the legs for that. Phantom and Hamilton. It's, it's, it's a few companies um, that, that can really, really just do that on a consistent basis. But they, they're great. And that's part of like, I'm getting my MBA. It's because Disney um, extends that, um, those opportunities to all of their employees, even furloughed um, for continuing education. So that's something that's been really helpful for my sanity. Um, and something that's going to be really great for my future, for for teaching, for job opportunities, um, be that in theater or theater adjacent. So that's they're awesome. I mean, that's not even the magical part. Like they, they, they were so generous. They got us tickets to Disneyland when we were out in California, and threw us parties. And you know, we did the Rose Parade, which was so cool. They provide so many opportunities to expand beyond just the production. Yeah, cool group of people. That's incredible. And congrats on your MBA, that's so cool. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. I mean, sometimes it feels like a blessing and sometimes it's like, I don't want to do homework right now. <laughs> I don't want to read. Neither do we. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, do I really have to write this, you know, seven page paper on the Italian economy? Really? But I do, and it's actually pretty cool. <laughs> See, I feel like that, I feel you. I always end up signing up for things and I'm like, this is gonna be so awful. And then I'm up at like 2 a.m. Like, so what was the root cause of like this tiny little political conflict in France? Like, we don't know, <laughs> we're gonna find it. Right, <laughs> let's dig, let's dig. So I'm really curious, especially, you know, with Frozen being such an iconic film and iconic Broadway show, I love getting like actors perspectives on just like, what was your favorite part of telling that story every night when you're a part of the tour? Before, um, one more time. <laughs> my favorite part of telling the story, um, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm a goofball. So I just like, I like making people laugh. Uh, I think, I think the Duke's entrance is my, my favorite, not his entrance during um, uh, the opening sequence uh, of when the gates open, but rather when he, he speaks to uh, the, princesses, the queen um, to be Elsa and Anna. And I, it's just foolery. I love trying to make people break on stage by just like going a little, like just edging on being like naughty. So that, I mean, that stuff, that's so fun. I mean, I think the most, the most insane parts of the show that are aside of the Duke of Wesselton, which I mean, he's, he's, he's there as a device. Uh, I think I, I mean I, I was always in awe in summer is so fantastic and F's F's version of that is spectacular and his his puppet work is masterful. So I I always loved watching that from the wings. Watching Caroline Bowman sing Let It Go was insane. It was just, you know, so so many awesome, awesome parts of that. But I think the most beautiful moment in the show, which I think others would argue, is when Anna gets frozen when she saves Elsa. And there's the beautiful, like all of the, the ensemble comes to form like the snow and ice drift off of Anna as she's frozen. And it's like, it's it's so incredibly lit with, with like laser projections and the music supports the moment. It's beautifully performed. It's like, it's that moment where you think, oh, everything is everything is bad and then it shifts to like this beautiful moment of healing and and unitedness and sisterhood so i think that's the most special part of the show i have to be off stage Ugh, but it is my favorite part of the show that's amazing and that's so funny what you said about making people break because emily and i cannot look at each other when we're on stage together because we will start laughing even if that's it's like the most serious scene we just cannot look at each other <laughs> well, I mean, like serious scenes, I, I think are also m more difficult because especially if, if you have any, you 
like you literally just see the laughter in each other's eyes and you're like oh i'm screwed and that happened <laughs> that happened on the waitress store like a bunch especially like early on with with lena Klingeman and i when she she originated dawn on the tour and she she had her on didn't you oh yeah we did so that was amazing that was amazing <laughs> And we would just look into each other's eyes and it would just like, we'd start to go. And then we'd have to, we'd look away from each other, but we could hear the laughter in each other's voices. And that was just the worst. But then we could look at each other because then we'd have to recognize that we're both losing our shit. So then we'd have to try and find ways to justify us giggling through a line. <laughs> it was so stupid. We were so stupid. I mean, it's distinct acting choices. Come on. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm deciding to laugh through all of my lines today. <laughs> that is my choice. It's, yeah, it's an acting uh, choice. <laughs> it is, uh, even if, you know, you have no choice in making that choice. Yeah. <laughs> so oh. now, a big part of your life has also been coaching. You and your wife founded Find Your Funny Studio, where you guys are offering virtual comedy and acting classes. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Totally. This, like, I feel so lucky to, for this to have kind of like formed in front of us. So, you know, being on the waitress tour, we met, um, being in so many different cities, in every single city, there were two Lulus, two local Lulus. And so they created like this tight knit community online where they all talk to each other. And so one of the moms, uh, uh, reached out and were like, hey, would you like do like a, a fun class, like an improv class for some of the Lulus? And I was like, we we're like, yeah, sure. We'll totally do that. And we, um, we did and we, you know, we, we put together a bunch of games and we decided like, great, we're gonna take this on. The first class was so fun. And I was like, I reached back out to the mom. I was like, hey, we'd love to do more of this. Um, do you know any other kids who might want to? And she immediately found like eight others. So we expanded to, we like immediately went from like one little class and then we opened up two other classes and that generated more demand. And so we ended up, we got up to seven classes along with private coaching every week. It started becoming like a very, like it felt like a legit business. We got up to like about 37, 38 students per week. That's dipped a little bit now, now that everything's like opening up and they're going on vacations. But it's it's been remarkably fun and rewarding. Uh, we started opening up our classes to older students. That was our recent edition where Ryan Duncan, who played Cal on The Waitress Tour, um, who is like a huge improv master, started uh, was co is co-teaching those Wednesday night classes with me. And we have just a ludicrous amount of fun. We have five to six students every week. We're capping our classes to keep it small because it's just tough on Zoom. With too many people, it's like you can't do anything. You can't really do group games where everyone's talking at once or whatnot. So we're keeping our classes small, which feels great. Um, and beyond that, we're we're coaching. We're coaching lots of auditions with, especially with the younger kids. And it's it's so rewarding. Just absolutely love it. That's incredible. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious, like what kind of, set like how do you approach your coaching how do you kind of go into a class how do you approach it mentally and like what makes your style unique would you say sweet so um i i feel like it's a circumstantial approach that that i use it's it's i'm all about prep like the more you know the more you can just like let go of all of that when you walk into the room so preparing to a point where um you don't have to think about the choices you don't have to think about the lyrics is going to create an organic experience in the audition room on the audition tape um, or even on the stage so prep prep is one uh and with that when we walk through coaching it's it's this is also stuff that i learned at nyu uh specifically for i mean for monologues and for for songs it's what's your trigger who are you talking to where are you what's your problem and how are you going to overcome that problem and you can break that down specifically into phrases, uh, but just laying that groundwork. And then I also think that a contingency slash like a holistic approach is always the best because everyone, you know, we're not all in the same school of acting. So if 
if I'm working with a student who's 10, it's probably going to be different from the way I'm working with a student who's 17, and I'm going to have to shift my, my tactics of trying to get through uh, to get the choices that I want. Yeah, absolutely. So now you're working with a really wide range of kids now. Yeah. What do you say is the most rewarding part about kind of going and getting to work with kids? Um, I feel like every age group carries its its distinct like awesomeness as well as like its distinct challenges as well. Um, we're like the six to nine, like just pure fun. Like we're we're not getting like crazy deep into anything, but also we're we're constantly surprised by the talents that these these kids have and their ability to like dig down into material. Um, but for our improv classes, we just, we have so much fun. We're starting to open up. We're like trying to have them create games as well, because I mean, improv games, they're all kind of, especially short for, form, which is what we're doing in, in our, our classes for the majority of the time. It's, they're all versions of the same thing. Where we're just listening response skills, um, creative thinking and storytelling. So it's like the building blocks of like, who am I? Like, what is my relationship to my surroundings and the people around me? Um, where am I? What am I doing? Just like, how do we accomplish those, those pieces of information and establishing a scene in a short period of time? And also like just lots of fun games where we get to just like say funny things. There's a great game called Headlines, which we're obsessed with now where one person says a headline. It can be anything. It's like, lamp goes on a parade, shady, not sunny. And like, whatever, that doesn't make sense. And then the next person would have to start their headline with sunny. They're like, sunny skies are covered by a flock of birds, evil or not? Like, whatever. So, um, so that's a game we're obsessed with right now. And you try and go as quickly as possible, moving around the circle just to get kids out of their head as a warm up game, moving on to some, some longer form scenes. That's awesome. And I mean, I just started cracking up when you said that. I feel like Emily and I would just play this game at like 12 when we're we can't sleep <laughs> with each yeah other. it feels really it, fun at parties jesse so much we're, we're really <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> so i guess just kind of wrapping up what are you most excited for as the world starts to reopen and we head into the next few months uh remarkably excited we already covered this to go see theater again and to be in a space with a group of people experiencing the same story on a stage I, I think that's like just what I'm so excited about. I, you know, I'm fully vaccinated. So is Alex. We're like, we're very, very like, yes, amazing. Love that. Um, so we've felt comfortable. We're going out to dinner with, with friends who are fully vaccinated and spending time with family. So that's something that has been awesome. I mean, as things open up, I'm, I'm so we're going to have a baby in September. So that's like, that's what I'm so excited about. And then like, that's as Broadway is opening up. So can't wait for that. And then we'll go back on tour with Frozen. So it's, it's a lot. I feel like I'm planning in such huge chunks as an adult. So it's like, all right, so this summer is going to be getting ready for the baby, working on film and TV stuff so I can um, get and in, break into that world a little bit more gearing up for the tour, making sure our car is big enough to carry all the baby stuff, like, you know, adult things like that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just the seeing of people. It's the creating in, in a rehearsal room again and letting people see that on a stage. So that's that's what I'm so pumped for. I'm pumped for people to, to be able to get back to work. It's been a tough year of, of isolation and not being able to express your creativity in the, the mediums and the manners that we used to as as artists so getting getting back into that with a new newfound perspective and feeling five years older from this the stress of this past year even though it's only been 18 months um i think will add to everyone's depth in their performances <laughs> maybe or maybe people just want to have fun like whatever i i think escapism is also such an important part of theater for people to laugh yeah and i think everyone's just going to have a newfound sense of appreciation for theater. So it's gonna be incredible. Yes, I agree. And I hope that can be a lasting, a lasting trend. I think that the demand that is pent up for theater is gonna, uh, talking to some other friends that they're like, it's gonna be the roaring twenties. Like demand for theater is gonna be like, like 
blow the roof off. And I also think the theater is going to start and is already starting to branch into streaming in ways it's going to share share part of that pie with with musical theater performers who really need it. You know, it's you don't get into the theater because you want to be rich. I mean, maybe some people do, but they are the minority. So it's it's going to be very helpful for the community and having some bringing some some wealth and some capital into this industry that really needs it. Yeah, for sure. It'll be very interesting to see kind of the balance between the live and the streaming as we go into the next few years. I I think it's important to make it more accessible and to get it in the hands of more people and to make sure that, like you said, the capital is there for people on the yeah. other side. I agree. I, I think it's going to happen. I think it's just reworking. I mean, it also has to do with, with union agreements. And I think part of the reason why not to get into like the whole union disputes about streaming and, and everything, but I I think that more more streaming will require more content and will give more jobs to more writers and have higher tur turnover and more creation. So I think that making it, I think the unions making it easier to produce things like this, to produce streaming material is essential, is essential for the long, I, I think for this industry to take it, take the next step and make musical theater more mainstream. I think it has to happen. Yeah, 100%. Uh, well, the next few months seem like they're going to be extremely exciting for you. Congratulations again. Crazy Thank you. Ahead. It's amazing. I'm so stoked to see all that you guys get to do, and it's going to be incredible. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. All right. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for taking the time today. This has been amazing to get to talk to you. Finally, we had such a great time getting to hear everything. And thank you so, so much for taking the time. <laughs> You're both amazing. Jesse, Emily, you rock. And thanks for doing this. It's so cool. I love seeing young, awesome entrepreneurs like doing, you're doing your thing and you're, you're putting in the work and, and hearing stories and telling stories and, and finding all this information out about humans. So you're incredible. Definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. A lot. And to connect with Jeremy on Instagram, follow at Jeremy C. Morris, where you can keep up to date on his latest projects. Be sure to follow Theatrical Thoughts at Theatrical Thoughts on Instagram as well. And yeah. yeah. Thank you guys so much for listening and we will see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.